Hello, I'm extremely grateful to be here, um, and let's let's go for it then. <laughs> okay, so uh, today I'll take you to the annotation processing world. Uh, let me ask you, how many of you ever used annotations? Right, most of you, right. Uh, how many of you actually created your own annotations before? Quite a lot, actually. And how many of you used build time or compile time annotation processes before? Yeah, really minor percentage of, of uh, all of you here. And even though it's a, it's a not new feature, it's not very well known because it's not something users or uh, developers would commonly do. It's usually uh, something what uh, frameworks are doing for them, so uh, developers are not experiencing it. But it's, it's, it's a great thing. So let me just quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is David Kral, and I work as a senior, dev senior developer at Oracle. I am currently stationed at uh, Halidon Project. Uh, if you'd like to reach me, there are some links there or uh, medias where you can find me and uh, we can have a talk or I can answer your questions if you will have any. And now, you know, let's go for it. Because even though <laughs> you basically all of you said that you know what's annotation, I would like to be on the same page for all of us. So let's go for uh, a quick introduction into what annotations are. Annotations are basically a form of metadata uh, added to the code. You can add your own information about certain uh, element in your class, for example, and then you can process it in runtime and uh, or compile time. Annotations always start with at, and uh, Java itself is providing a few of uh, annotations by itself. For example, at override, at deprecated and annotations like that. They are very well known. Um, as mentioned, it is possible to create your own annotations and um, you will create your annotation the way, very similar to, for example, as if you are creating uh, an interface, right? But instead of just a keyword interface at the header of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, interface, you will mention it as at interface. At that moment, you are creating a custom annotation. Um, then you will define all of the stuff you'd like to uh, be able to set to the annotation, such uh, or stuff like, I mean, information, obviously. Uh, but you have to follow a certain, certain uh, rules. Uh, and those rules are that those information has to be final at the compilation time. You can't create um, annotation which would have its value resolved during the, uh, during the runtime. It, it's not possible. It has to be final at the compilation time. Meaning, because of that, you can use only strings, the class literals, uh, enumerations, primitive types, or even other annotations. You can do that as well. Right, so now let's quickly take a look into how um, uh, custom annotation look like. So as you can see, it's very similar to how regular interface is, uh, but there is this at interface edit, and there is something similar to, for example, gather, without the get, obviously, the, the record way, let's say. And uh, that's basically it. To, to this value, we can save uh, the string value we would like this annotation to hold. Uh, there are two more annotations added to when we are creating custom annotations, and those are target and retention. Um, basically, the target mentions at uh, which element you would like this annotation to use, such as um, whether it should be present on type, or field, or method, or um, places like that. The retention uh, is basically the information about whether this annotation should be present even in the runtime, or only at the compile time, and stuff like that. 
But we will not get uh, too deep into those because this presentation is about uh, annotation processing itself. So what's annotation processing? It's basically a tool for handling Java annotations at compile time. Uh, it allows to generate uh, a new code or a new files and uh, also validate your, your um, class components. Um, the great thing about the annotation processors is that the generated code is always compiled with the correct Java. What I mean by that is, um, for example, if you are using any library for bytecode manipulation, you have to usually wait for developer to update that, uh, uh, that library to support the latest Java you would like to, uh, for example, uh, bytecode manipulate. But with annotation processing, it will use the Java you are currently using. So you do not have to, need, uh, you do not have to wait for anything. You just uh, generate a code, and it will get built with the Java, uh, Java uh, compiler. Also, great thing is that uh, annotation processors do not suffer from type erasure, meaning that if you are using, for example, generics uh, in your code, you will see the generics which you have used in the classes or were used in the classes and you'll see them in the annotation processors as well. So it's very easy to work with, it's very easy to target um, the specific types you would like to process, do something with and, and stuff like that. Important thing to note is that the pr overall processing is happening in rounds meaning that uh, the first round usually consists of the classes uh, of w which you have created yourself, but since you can generate also a class which will have, for example, annotation which should be processed by another processor, because of that, you need to respin the round. You need to make another round uh, of the processors with uh, the newly generated classes. And this is how it works. Basically, you are iterating until you have everything processed and uh, there is nothing else and, or nothing new to build. Right, so what is annotation uh, processing commonly used for? Uh, very often it is used for uh, reduction of the boilerplate code because you can design your uh, annotation processors to simplify your overall work. Uh, for example, when you are doing builders, right? Builders are always follow the same pattern, the, the same rules, and you can create um, a processor which will do that for you. It will take your class and it will generate corresponding builder to the class. So you have, uh, you have simplified way of, of uh, building that object, for example. It can also improve performance, and what I mean by that is, for example, if you would be having a parser uh, for, I don't know, JSON, XML, you name it, it doesn't matter, you can pre-create your parsers for specific types, even your special beans, uh, at compile time, because you know which class it will be, and you can pre-create those processors, then you do not need to use a reflection at runtime and your code will be much faster, which is great. And uh, it is commonly used also for static analysis and the validation itself it's, uh, of, of, the, of the class. Right, so how to start with it? What should we do first? Well, firstly, we need to create a new class. We would like uh, to be the, the processor. And to make it processor, the fastest way is to actually make it extend uh, abstract processor class. Um, once you do that, you are having the first step ready. Then you need to figure out which annotations you would like to process. Uh, I don't know if it actually even makes sense to uh, to, to one process all the annotations you could find, it is much better to, simp to specify the annotations directly. Um, the annotations can be specified two ways. You can use a method uh, delivered by the abstract processor, which is called the get supported type, uh, annotation types. 
you will list it there and you will return the set of strings. Those strings are the fully qualified names of the, of the classes. Uh, sorry, annotations you would like to support. Or you can use an annotation which you place on the processor, which is called supported annotation types. And you will do basically the same thing, but you are not using a uh, set, of course. You will, uh, you will uh, mention those types there as an array. Um, once you are having that, oh, yeah, maybe one thing to note that you can use a star or asterisk to uh, include all the annotation or limit the annotations you would like to process. For example, that you will say only a certain package, then place dot and the star, and you will support only the annotations for, from this particular package. For if, you, if you have a lot of those and you do not want to list them all because it would be like 30 lines of code, for example. So you can, you can do that easily as well. Right, and once that's done, you need to implement the method process. Uh, method process is therefore the, the actual generation of the, of the class or the file based on the annotated uh, class components. Right, so this is how uh, the, the annotation processor could look like. Really, it's, it's just a regular class, as you are familiar with. It's extending abstract processor, and uh, it's having the process method um, created. Um, and also, as I've mentioned, those supported annotations, I have used the annotation here. Um, if you wouldn't be having uh, those listed annotations which you would like to process mentioned in the processor, it wouldn't be called. So it would be ignored. So be wary of that. Uh, if you would like to play with that a bit uh, and suddenly your processor wouldn't be executed, that might be the cause. Another thing you need to do to actually execute your annotation processor is uh, to create a new file in uh, metainf services folder. Uh, this file has to be called as uh, javax.annotation.processing.processor. This is, this is mandatory. This is not uh, something I uh, made up. You have to do that. And into that file place um, the fully qualified path to your, to your uh, annotation processor. So, for example, in my case, it would be IO Prime and my annotation, uh, sorry, IO J Prime and my annotation processor. That could be it. And that's it. What, that's all you need to do. Now, the tricky part comes when you want to actually start using the annotation processor because if you place annotation, annotation processor to the same package uh, or the same module uh, as you are having your class which contains, for example, that annotation you like to process, um, it's not trivial to solve because what you need to do first is to compile the processor itself and then you can use it to process the classes. You can't do it on the single run. It, it's just not possible. So uh, what you can do, if you have it separate, just use this proc none, which basically disables annotation processing. So uh, you will be able to compile your annotation processor in one module, then use it, for example, as a dependency to the second module, which contains the, the classes you would like to process and everything will work as it should. Then you obviously do not use that proc none because otherwise it wouldn't be executed. Or if you are having it in the single module, then you have to, for example, in a Maven, use the two runs uh, of the compiler plugin. In the first one, just compile that annotation processor itself, and in the second one, uh, to, to handle the rest of the classes you are having there. And ev again, everything will work as expected, but it requires a, a little bit more work to, to make it work. Right, now let's take a look into the uh, method process. Um, method process is basically the entry point to your annotation processor. It's the first thing 
or <laughs> nearly the first thing, because the first thing is actually the init method. We will get to that later. But it's, it's the first method which is called when we are trying to generate something. It contains two parameters. The first parameter is a set of annotations which are required to be processed by this particular uh, processor. And the second one is uh, the round environment. The round environment is um, the well, environment which contains the found classes for this round of, uh, of validation or generation. Right. So now, if we know what uh, the method process is, we know what round environment is, and uh, we would like to move on, we need to take a look into the, uh, sorry, the uh, processing environment. The processing environment uh, is basically an interface which provides set of utilities and supporting services for annotation processor. Uh, and a okay, good question would be how to get it. Because it wasn't part of those parameters in the method process. So for us to be able to obtain it, we need to use one of the two ways. Either implement the method in it, which comes from the annotation processor, or uh, if we are using abstract processor as we are, we can use the protected field called processing env. We can use that and uh, we don't, do not need to have that init method um, specified at all. So once we are having that, uh, the good thing to know is which method, uh, met methods from, from this uh, processing environment are actually important for us. Well, the first one is element utils. It's, um, it's an interface which uh, contains utility methods for program element handling. What do I mean by program elements? I'll get to that later because it's, it's part of this presentation as well. Then there is uh, get type utils. It uh, contains helpful methods for type operation handling. Again, if, uh, if you are handling the types, you will need some, some utility for that because uh, it's not that simple as it might look like at this moment. And then there are two very important methods or the types it's returning, and that's uh, the uh, get messenger and it return, returns basically the compo component which allows you to log messages from your annotation processor or uh, even let your compilation fail. For example, if it encounters some invalid code, your annotation was, was uh, requiring something else and stuff, it will, uh, you will be able to just simply let your code fail, uh, sorry, compilation fail and um, and uh, let the user uh, fix it. That's what the get messenger is used for. And then there is a method get filer, which returns filer. And uh, that's, um, that's a class or implementation you will get that's uh, something responsible for an actual class generation or the file generation. So. These are, these are the methods you will very commonly use when you are working with annotation processing. Now, let's take a look into the element because elements, um, when I first saw annotation processing and I saw element, I was confused. I wasn't sure what element is. I'm currently processing type or class, right? So what the hell is element? Um, element is basically the representation of Java program component, meaning that um, if we are processing a type, cer a certain type, such as, I don't know, car, um, Java, uh, sorry, not Java element, but this element represents this class, but it also represents its field because the element is like the topmost uh, top interface of the whole structure. For simplification, you can, you can imagine it as a DOM element if, if it helps you any, anyway. And it also uh, can represent methods, constructors, basically any part of the class 
but uh, then the type of the element will depend on what it describes, whether it was field, method, because methods are executable elements, fields are variable elements, class is type element, and stuff like that. Okay, so how to use elements, how to work with them. Um, for example, if you would like to get all the classes annotated with our custom annotation we have created before, we could use a round environment and call method get elements annotated with. Then we would specify the annotation we would like, uh, we would like to find all elements with, and it will return to us um, a collection of, of those elements. Then we will go through them, and for example, I just did a very simple, uh, very simple logic here, which gets the name of the element itself and prints it out with the messenger I have described a few slides before. Right. So this is how it works with uh, how you work with elements. Then, because uh, those namings never end, so type mirror. It's um, it's basically what you are used to currently in Java when we are talking about the type of certain thing. Like uh, if we have a field, it has a name, and it, overall, it's an element in annotation processing. But if we would like to get the information about what type this element is of, such as if it is string, a, a string uh, field, then it would be returning the type mirror. So the information about the actual type of this particular uh, element, that's what the type mirror is. It can represent really anything. It can represent primitive types, declared types, uh, arrays, or basically anything else, uh, an, uh, anything you, you, you can imagine. So that's what type mirror is. And how to get it, how to, how to work with it. Again, I took the same thing as before uh, and extended it a bit. And right now, as you can see, I got uh, not just the name of the element, but I used method as type, and I got an actual type of, of that particular element. So if it was, for example, uh, on a field, we would get the type of the field. If it was on the, on the um, uh, on a class itself, we would get the type of the of the class, and this is how we work with it. It's it's not exactly intuitive when you see it the first time, and you have to have to get used to it. But once you do, it's it's great. It's really powerful, and you can do basically whatever with it. Um, now, how to generate the code? How to, how to use the generator. For that, we will use the get filer. That's, that's the method I have described before that we will uh, use for an actual file generation. So once we do that, we need to specify the complete uh, path of the, of the class. And uh, we will get object, which is called uh, Java file object, which is basically the representation of um, of a class which will be generated. Then we have to use method open writer, which will open writer to, to, that, to that file. And then we are just commonly writing and uh, placing the code uh, to, to, to generate a class. I know it could be created with multi-line string, obviously. But uh, with code generation, you will not use it that often as you might expect. Because since you are processing annotations, since you are processing such a data, you will very likely need to place a certain logic between the, between the start, for example, of the method and the end, or even uh, whether to add certain method or not, and, and, and stuff like that. So this is more common way of writing an actual class. And as you can see, you are in charge. You have to do everything. Meaning that if you wouldn't, for example, that at those new lines at the end of the line, uh, at, of, uh, at the end of each line, you will have you would have everything on a single line. 
So it's kind of tricky to work with because, you know, people kind of forget stuff like new lines or even the paddings. Imagine the, imagine the headache, for example, if I would decide I would like to create an inner class right now and move this generated method there. I would have to create that inner class and add another padding to the, to the method. Basically, to do all by myself, because if I wouldn't, it wouldn't be properly formatted or readably formatted. It would work, but it wouldn't be nice for, uh, it would be nicely generated. So this is what it generates. Right now, it's OK, I guess. It's reasonably formatted, even though I would like to do it uh, a bit differently. But it's OK. Now, annotation processing has certain limitations. Uh, for example, you can't modify an existing class. You simply cannot take class you have developed yourself and add a new method to it or change the behavior of certain method or stuff like that. You can do that. that that's, that's not allowed at this, uh, in this tool. But what you can do is to modify the resources. You can easily modify resources you have created. By resources, I obviously mean anything but Java classes. Um, as mentioned, starting could be a bit complicated, but as mentioned, if you get used to it, it's very okay and it's very easy to use. Uh, also, the order of the processors uh, cannot be guaranteed, meaning that if you are having multiple processors and one would depend on each other, uh, sorry, one would depend on the other, you would be having problems because you don't know which one will be executed first. One time it would work, but the second time it wouldn't have to necessarily work properly. So that's, that's kind of a problem. And now let's take a look into some unexpected difficulties I was having when I was developing, when I was designing annotation processor the first time. You know, when, it, when someone says, let's build uh, or generate a class, you think, sure, I'll just, you know, want this class to be generated. And it should be simple, right? It should be, it should be easy. You should write just the class. But you will very, very soon find out that taking care of paddings, taking care of formatting, taking care of imports, that's kind of... Uh, impossible task sometimes, and syntax that you have to handle everything yourself. And that's, that's not exactly great. And because of, these, uh, because of these difficulties, it's hard to generate nice and readable code. So it, it's possible, but it requires a lot of work. Not to mention that any maintain of the code, if you need to extend it, if you need to um, as I mentioned with the inner class, for example, if you want to change the structure, <laughs> it's just unbelievable. And because, that, because of that, there are helpful libraries you can use for your code generation. For example, Halidon class model. Yeah, I'm mentioning it because I work for Halidon, and that's what we are using there. Or you can use Java Poet or Lombok, even though I'm not exactly a fan of uh, bytecode manipulation, which it does as well. And you could use also um, stuff like Halidon Builders to, simplification, uh, to simplify your build generation. That's what we are uh, even using. Uh, I'll get to that later. Now, let me give you a very brief introduction to Halidon because uh, I believe that there are some people among you who might not be familiar with Halidon in general. So Hel Halidon is basically a, a set of libraries for you to help develop microservices. We are providing two modules or two, two flavors as we call them. The first one is Halidon SE. It's like, it's very minimalistic. 
uh, you are in charge of everything. So you are responsible for, for example, routing and basically everything. And there is no edit magic, meaning that there is no injection. Uh, there is nothing like uh, runtime annotation processing and stuff like that. On the other hand, we have MP, which is exactly the opposite. And it contains all of the stuff you are used to. Um, now, why I'm talking about it is actually that we use heavily annotation processing in Halidon SE APIs. Because basically all the APIs in Halidon SE which we are having are based on builder patterns. And no, we were not using annotation processors at the beginning. And to be fair, it was very hard to maintain the APIs. Because every single time when we edit uh, certain options, some, some fields to a certain class because we wanted to extend it, we had to, ha had to add, for example, three, five, six more methods to the builders because we wanted uh, to have uh, more options, how to configure certain stuff. And it was really hard. So we developed something we call uh, Halidon Builder or Builder Generator. And it allows us to generate always up-to-date builders for uh, our, our classes or for our configuration classes. And it's very easy to use. We just Annotate it with certain annotations. We run the compilation, and there you go. That's it. Um, as mentioned, it is used heavily in Halidon SE API. So if you would be using Halidon 4, for example, which is the latest version, uh, you and Halidon SE, I mean, obviously, uh, you would be using these automatically generated, uh, generated APIs as well. We added something new or currently adding because we are still fixing some bugs and shaping up the API, but we called it service registry. Uh, it uh, handles the generation of service descriptor. It's, uh, let's say, an enhanced uh, service loader, which uh, provides more functionality than the regular Java one does. And we are, f for that, we are using annotation processors as well. And in the future, um, uh, we might add also uh, an in build time injection, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, for all of these generators, we are using CodeGen class model. This is a tool which helps us to design the class the way we would like, for example, that we set specific name, we will set specific package, we will uh, add method, add import, add, uh, add field, whatever. But we don't care how the result is generated. That, that's something what this tool does. We only need to know what we want to do. So we can design, uh, for example, a method. We add desired lines there. And again, that's all we need to care. Then we add it to the class itself and let it generate. And at the end, we will get the result of properly formatted class with fully processed imports. So that's a good thing as well. And the great thing is, or a bit pain point was when we were not using it, for example, we started writing a class to the output, right? And we went through, we wrote the package. We said, okay, so we will, we know that we will need these imports. So we added them and then started writing the class. But at certain point we have found out, okay, so we would like to add this type as well, but we didn't add it among the imports. And that's a problem because you can't go back. You are writing to the, to the, uh, to the Java writer. So you are done. You have to use a fully, specific, uh, fully, uh, fully qualified class name. And that's not nice. And that's one of the things which this tool actually solves. It handles the imports and manages them and also orders them so it at least looks nice. Okay, so 
let's take a look into how our previous example would look like with the class model of ours. Let's say we would like to generate a class, which is called a generated class, as, as before, and add, add to this class the single method, generated method with that line. This is all you need to do, and this is all you need to take care of. Then you will take the build it, build it model, you will get the, the writer from the filer, and that's basically it. You will provide this writer to the build it model, and it will generate it for you. On the right, you can see how the result look like. It's very easy, properly formatted, and uh, it simplified our work enormously. Now, imagine that you would like to also add, uh, for example, documentation to the generated code, because that's a great thing to have, the documentation in, in that. And again, it's very simple, just add one method, method description, where we have specified the description which should appear in that method. And it automatically generated for us the whole, uh, the whole Javadoc structure, and we didn't have to do anything other than that. Now let's take a look into something a little more complex. For example, if you would like to add a parameter. Again, we don't care when we are currently at a certain method, how we would write it, or anything like that. All we need to do is to say, hey, I want to add a parameter. And then we will get a builder for that, or we can do it ourselves, but right now I am getting the builder out of the method builder. And I'm setting that it will be of some type cat. Let's say it's from some other package. And I set the name of it. And I set some description. And once I press generate, or let it generate, better to say, you can see that the same method was extended over the new parameter. And the same parameter was also added to the javadoc, because obviously it should be there and the description was added as well. So you can see it's, it's very easy to use, and uh, I think it's also very intuitive uh, when, when, we would be, when you are using it. Right, and that's pretty much it from my end. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you like it. Yay! Awesome. Thank you so much, David. We don't uh, tolerate questions, but if you want to talk to David, he will be here until tomorrow, I guess, yes? In the morning. Yep. Yep. Yes. Thank you so much, David. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.